adds up analysis and representation. And we have pretty excellent prizes, so I would say to fill up that crossword. So, okay, what is perizine? Perizine is an aromatic hydrocarbon. It's a derivative of benzene with two methyl substituents on it. Uh, so it's an isomer, and that's why it's para. So you see there. Um, it is colorless, it's a liquid, and it's flammable, and has a sweet odor. So what does it come from? Well, it comes from uh, the reforming of petroleum, and that is catalytic reforming, uh, and it's part of the PTX group of uh, hydrocarbons, so benzene, polyethylene, and uh, What is it used for? Well, it's mainly used to make terephthalic acid, which is then used in the production of polyester fabrics and plastics. Uh, who produces it? Well, mostly oil companies like BP and Chevron. And we're talking uh, millions of tons per year, so it's really quite a high volume commodity. And who is, or how is it produced? So it's produced through separation. Uh, so there's a couple of separation steps. The most uh, relevant ones are crystallization. And uh, so the most relevant one is crystallization. And what it is, is because the boiling point of xylene and its isomers is really close, it's sort of hard to separate it in that method, but its freezing point, its crystallization among the isomers is actually quite uh, big. It's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So we take advantage of that to take it out of solution and crystallize it. And uh, Leah's going to go into the actual process over here. So this diagram is from the separation process. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so 
our Hazmat uh, analysis, we're going to talk about our unit is our melt tank, shown here as E7. And our node is P16, so that's the recycle stream entering um, the melt tank. So we looked at two, we're going to be talking about two parameters, flow rate and temperature. So I'm going to start with flow rate. So um, the first case that we looked at was an increase or a high flow rate of the recycle stream. So this can be uh, primarily caused by a blockage in V10, just shown there, between uh, the through ray valve. So basically here you have um, restriction of flow from 14 to 15. So consequences of this could be um, you have decreased production because stream 15 is our final product stream. So therefore it's not restricted, you're going to have decreased production rate. And another consequence could be damage to um, pipe 16 as it's not supposed to be, it's not built for such a high flow rate. It's a 10% recycle to the 15. Um, so our, our solution to this would be to create a bypass around valve 10 connecting um, pipe 14 and 15. So that valve would then be controlled by the flow rate of the recycle immediately about to enter the melt tank. So if that flow rate was to be too high, then um, that valve would open and allow some of the product to exit the system and thereby reduce the recycle. Uh, the second case that we looked at was a low flow rate recycle entering the melt tank. And uh, causes for that to be leakage in the pipe, fouling of the pipe, or again, a blockage in V10, <coughs> restricting flow from 14 to 16 at that. So consequences of that, in the case of leakage, would be loss of product. And um, otherwise, it would be if, um, if, if you don't have enough flow rate going into the melt tank, this flow rate is being heated up here. So um, it actually aids in the melting process of the crystals. So if you don't have enough flow rate, then you're not getting enough melting. And if you're, if you're not getting enough melting, you're going to get solids lodged into the pump, which could possibly um, cause that stuff to happen. So um, our solution to that would be, again, to create a bypass um, around V10 connecting pipe 50, uh, 14 to 16. So this valve would also be controlled by the, the recycle stream, the flow rate of the recycle stream entering E7, the melt tank. And um, yeah, so that's our redundancy there. Also, we have a flow rate indicator just as an additional redundancy to see if um, everything is going smoothly. Now, Anna will talk about our temperature parameters. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. That is just what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so, for this parameter, we're considering the temperature of the exhaling coming out from 516 and going into the melt tank. Uh, if the temperature is controlled by our temperature controller TC2 right here and it connects to the valve on the heat exchanger E10. So it, um, we're considering two cases for now. The first case is when the temperature is too high. The con consequence of this is basically we're using more power than we really need to and that's just energy cost in, and uh, there will be heat increasing uh, in E7 over and over again, but it's never going to reach any uh, alarming temperature because this is still done at a relatively low temperature of uh, up to 3 degrees Celsius, between 3 and 10. Then, um, so in order to correct that, we added a redundant temperature controller with a redundant valve right here. So if something goes wrong, uh, we will switch to our controller and we will find out what's wrong with this so, uh, temperature controller and fix it. To find out what's wrong, we added a temperature indicator on the melt tank where we could see the readings and if they coincide with what our temperature controller has and see if the sensor is working on the temperature controller or if something is wrong with the valve right here. Uh, for the second case is when the temperature is too low. The consequence of this is that possibly we won't get all the peaks out of the and as John said, the, that could lead to problems with uh, fouling in the pipes and breaking the pump E right there. Uh, for In this case, we need an alarm because if that happens, we would have to shut down their whole plant and so we add an alarm on E7 which we would be sure that the body temperature is reaching uh, a point where not all the design would be crystallized. So in the next slide, I'm, this is a summary of what I just said. And right now, I, we would like you to take a couple of minutes to look over your crossword. 
and complete it. The first five people who get everything right will get candy. <laughs> Do you have a question? Everybody's oh, free to. Well, if you fill it out, you should probably get it to us. Like
um, it's about 8 to 10 feet. So you need to have additional storage of those activated carbon on site. And another thing is that this activated carbon is processed, regeneration process is expensive, so it's usually done off site. So that's another reason to have a storage. And one of the obvious ones is that the backup electricity um, generators needs to be there because ozone generators are running on In order to make our system more flexible, um, there is one disturbance that we need to see, and one of the disturbance is that due to season changes, there are organis <coughs> organisms that change in the water. In warmer months, we have more organics, so we need more ozone in order to treat the same amount of water. In colder months, um, we need less ozone. So in order to accommodate for the change, either you design the ozone generator in excess capacity, or you can provide a multiple ozone generator in order to and this topic is really interesting for this process, the startup process. This is really important for people who are in commercial business. They need to think about what's going to happen when you start up the process. And in our process, the main concern is around the ozone generator. If there is a moisture in the ozone generator and the electrodes are powered up in order to produce ozone, then the corrosive condenser will produce which is not good. So one of the suggestions is that either dry air or oxygen should be allowed to flow through ozone generator in order to ensure that any moisture that's in generator is removed before you energize the electrodes. So that condenser won't fall. In this process, approximately it takes four hours. Now that's a long process when you are in rush or you don't have a 12 hour window of time. As an alternative, either you um, Small flow of dry air can be passed through the generator, so your generator is always dry and that can be used. And this option is strongly recommended for backup generators because think about it, if you have a backup generator and a condenser form, then you have to shut down the first step. So how does the ozone generator work? So basically you supply power to it and then uh, there's cooling water in here. So there are electrodes 
And then through that also there's generated there's like a gas bubble that's a form of supply to the earth. So the electrons working mm -hmm. properly now? I guess, uh, so the engineer who designed this um, was a janitor, which is so all their design uh, courses, I guess. And the janitor was actually under design. Um, so to fix this problem, um, you could either uh, replace the janitor with a bigger size one or um, add some more generators to um, supplement the amount of ozone that they serve.
where the, the high pressure of the body weight is lowered to avoid uh, damaging our storage tank. And uh, from here, the steam is recycled into the carbonate, uh, the carbonate absorber. And so finally, the bio is stored in number 16, which is our storage tank. And um, it is used downstream to become purified urea and eventually form our end product, which is urea pellets.
second parameter um, is pressure, and uh, for a high pressure deviation, some of the consequences could be the increased pressure in the reactor and um, eventual uh, reactor deformation and damage. Um, a, a cause of this could be an increased CO2 flow in the stripper itself. And um, what we could do to correct this is install high, a high pressure alarm or install a burst diaphragm rupture disc on the reactor itself. And um, for low pressure deviation, um, some of the consequences could be fouling in the pipes. Um, possible uh, causes of this could be a leak somewhere in the pipe, possible blockages in the pipe, and sensor failure. Uh, what we could do to correct this is install multiple pressure sensors at the electric. That's it. And so this diagram here then shows uh, the corrected uh, as of now so the first diaphragm, the pressure sensor, and the temperature. So now we have our game, I guess. It's, uh, it's a version of Jeopardy. So I'm sure some of you have watched it and know how the game works. So I guess we'll get a. Uh, Okay. So as it goes down, as the prizes get better, the questions also get harder from our presentation. So, what will we get? Categories? Let's start off with. Who comes for 200? Sure, profit, process intro, movies, So, what year was SASCO founded in? Okay, that's my <laughs> Sure. <laughs> How about we all make a buzzer noise too to attract my attention? <laughs> okay, we can go first. Then. Okay, so what year was it? Sorry? Yes, that is right. Yes, you win, chocolate, as well as the chance to pick the next question. <laughs> okay, how about for candy? So, what type of vessel does the main reaction take place in? Ah, oh, if I break that, that would be my point. Come on. Right? <laughs> what is the key example? Look at that Scott entirely. So, again. Yeah. Yeah. Shell <laughs> communication. What is the shell communication? Okay, okay. 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 What is the shell communication? You can also pick the next category. <laughs> I'll take uh, Hazard for gum, please. Hazard for gum. <laughs> so don't forget the mother noise, okay? Okay, so what is the possible consequence of high pressure in the vapor in the reactor? Yes, please. Sorry? Okay, I guess it looks like that. <laughs> Judges say yes. <laughs> Okay, you can also pick the next category. Uh, <laughs> overview for chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that was already done, sorry. <laughs> sorry? <laughs> overview for gum. What is the most common stripping agent used in the in your reproduction and why? Oh, I heard that. What is CO2? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gum, 
which is uh, what change was introduced to the system with, with, with the pump and what aspect of the operability would it fall under? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And the last question is from Hazla. Um, if, if the flow of the vapor inlet to the reactor increases, will the resident time in the reactor increase or decrease? Decrease. Decrease? That's correct. Thank you for... <laughs> picture, right? So hazard and operability has that OP. It's not just impacting on the safety. All the, all the suggestions you make, so addition of new sensors, take it further than that. Those new sensors are not going to solve the issue for you. They also need to be hooked up and looped into the existing control system. So then you've got a, another issue taking place. You've now introduced a closed loop control system. How is that going to impact the operability? Is it on a recycled stream that's feeding back into an earlier part of your flow sheet? What's going to happen when that feed comes back? So we've seen in a few of the classes, we get that recycled energy or increased heat taking place through the system. So not only must your suggestion make sense to solve the issue that you're looking at, but also consider it in terms of the overall operability of the process. Have you impacted any other parts of the existing process as well? So, so consider the complete picture. Uh, Thank you.